are now tuned in to the OSINT Curious Podcast. Okay, welcome everyone. Welcome to the OSINT Curious Podcast. We are doing our webcast. We're doing our second live version. I wasn't at the first one, so I'm excited to be here. My name's Kirby Plessis, and I go by Curbster on Twitter. We got Micah Hoffman with us. Hi, everybody. We've got Dutch OSINT guy. Hi, everyone. We've got Ginsburg, 5150. Hello. And we've got Sector. Hi, everybody. And we have a special guest today, Justin Seitz. Did I say it right or is it? Not Seitz, you got it. I'm All here. right, Justin Seitz from <laughs> Hunchley fame. And he's also got, of course, the uh, dark web email list as well, which is amazing, and the dark web OSINT guide. Thank you for joining us, Justin. Uh, and I forgot, automatingosint.com, that as well. Yeah. Oh, well, thanks for all the plugs and thanks for having me today. All right. Well, we're, we're going to have a lot of questions for you later, Justin, but just jump in as we go along for the rest of our um, session today, whenever you want, whenever you have any points. All right, I'll do it. Okay. Thank all right, here we go. You guys can see my Firefox browser now, I am assuming? Yes. Yes. Okay, cool. All right. I just thought I'd start us off on our web and podcast page for We Are OSINT Curious. For those who are watching on YouTube in the future, I'm talking to the future people now. This is how you're going to find us if you want to come down here and join us in the future. So two weeks from today, we'll have another uh, live broadcast and you can see the dates actually down here. <clears throat> okay. So let's go on to our program. Um, the first thing uh, we had on the list, article from Schneider on security. Michael, was this you that kind of submitted this one? This Nico. Nico? Well, this was from last week, so I mm -hmm. think this wasn't my note. We already discussed this oh. one, but I'm willing to go in oh. depth on it. It was NATO uh, doing a red team action on uh, soldiers, basically. So they're trying to lure them onto social media for disinformation, but also trying to test them into, uh, well, making OPSEC mistakes just by posting pictures, getting curious. So I thought it was really interesting that the military is, tests his own people this way. Yeah, it's That'd a lot different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a lot different than, than some of the other red team tests that, that maybe us in cyber are used to where we're going against systems. Here, they use social engineering, they use catfish accounts, they uh, tried to, to like all the things that the soldiers liked. And sure enough, you know, after a little bit of gaining their confidence, just like with social engineering, uh, they were able to get a whole bunch of information. It's a well written article, too, if you, you haven't uh, read any of Bruce's stuff. Um, really good. Good, good report there. Yeah, I'm gonna. It's again Schneier on security, which is Schneier.com. S C H N E I E R. This is going to be in our show notes. The article is attacking soldiers on social media. Yep. All right, let's go on to the next one. Elliot Higgins posted on Twitter. Yeah, that that was a neat thing. Um, uh, I saw that that Bellingcat. I mean, if you're not if you're innocent and you're not following Bellingcat's uh, Twitter account. Definitely give that a try. They have so much good content, whether it's their OSINT, their OSINT resource uh, Google Sheet or whether it's the the wonderful articles that they publish. Uh, Elliot uh, Higgins published this uh, or tweeted this out, and uh, he mentioned that there's now this new Twitter account for for uh, for Bellingcat that is open source leads, and it's kind of a challenge and kind of helping them out, and uh, it's actually pretty cool. I I haven't really gone deeper than just noticing that but has anybody else uh, visited the account yet yeah I've, I've been visiting it um, I think it's really interesting for people who are beyond the basics of OSINT or online investigative work and they get challenged just by uh, them dropping a question on open source leads account they will just ask you a question and you can dig in so it's just can you look at this video and tell me where this this is in the world? Can you look at this piece of clothing and which brand is it and where is it sold? Those kind of questions will be asked on that account. And you can help participate in ongoing investigations from Bellingcat, but also from other journalists or just curious people trying to find out things almost always for good. So. Cool. Almost always. 
Yeah, probably. I don't know. You don't know someone's hidden agenda. Yeah. So. so I do have a question because I've not really looked into this. Is this like the uh, traffic cam view thing for helping with uh, like human trafficking, sex work stuff? Or is this just a playground type place where people just post up and just kind of go in and sharpen skills like maybe geo, geolocate test quiz thing? No, I think this is more serious and more uh, in, in that than that. Cool. All right. Okay, let's move on. So again, that was from Open Source Leads, uh, that Bellingcat's new platform. Uh, built with, uh, and apparently didn't want to load from my browser when I loaded it earlier, so we'll see if it comes back up. Is there, um, and I, I can't remember what was in the notes there. Let me check that out again. It was, uh, it was me. You know, we, we talked about uh, the Google Analytics codes and using spy on web and things like that to, to track different sites. Well, uh, Josh, uh, Beowulf88, uh, he was, or Josh Huff, Beowulf88, uh, mentioned that the Build With site here, if you type in a domain name there, like, uh, well, whatever you want, CNN.com is just one that I use a lot. Uh, there is uh, some really good information about uh, sharing sites and relationships in the in the tabs there, the relationship profile. Uh, yep. And if you click on that, you can see the tag history connected, but you scroll down the page and it has other type of relationship information, uh, including addresses. So what other sites have been using this IP, these domain names? Not sure why it's loading, but not well. Yeah, you know, I don't know if that's my, um. <laughs> there we go. There we go. But I mean, you could see it's, it's like over time, this other site and that other site have been noticed. But wait, there's more. It, as you scroll down, it will actually show you like Google Analytics codes and other stuff um, if they appear on the page. So uh, this uh, and the, the functionality here with Built With to go back in time and analyze who also was using these servers, really, really helpful. And uh, big shout out to Josh Huff for, for showing that to me. So I love the idea of this, but I know that Built With is very touchy unless you get a sign up. So you can sign up for free, but make sure you sign in because otherwise you get one try per IP address per, I don't know if it's an hour or a day. Um, so if you're gonna do this, um, definitely get every in account. Cool, thanks for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's take a look at an article on our own website, OSIN Curious. Yeah, so, I'm playing this one, Micah. Micah jumped into the dark web. Yeah, so I was in my uh, my class, uh, the Sec 47 class for SANS, the OSINT class, and one of the students, uh, we were going through some tour labs, and one of the students said, "Well, what's that?" And you know, I I love going off script. I love I love I actually took this from Justin Sites, who's on the phone with us right now. So Justin. <laughs> <laughs> Huge shout out for you for for just you know giving that permission to go off script and try things and and you know fail or succeed but just try things in front of students and attendees. Um, so so we were on Fresh Onions, uh, the the wonderful website or a version a newer version of the Fresh Onions. We're not sure who actually owns it yet, uh, but uh, we were looking there and one of the features in Fresh Onions is to show interesting directories that are on Tor Onion services. And one of the things I saw was that there was this server status page, which I was familiar with when I was using the, when I was doing web hacking. And I was like, well, server status page normally is like, who cares? You know, it's like, oh, wow, we can see the requests. Unless people are putting like usernames and passwords on the URL, which will show up in that image that's on the screen right here, uh, where the two is, you'll see like username equals whatever, and, uh, the password. But Normally, we don't care, but in the case with Tor Onion Services, one of the things that we don't want to share with people is what IP address we're running the server off of and what um, other domains or Onion Services are running. So if you scroll down the page, Kirby, you'll see that we can look at uh, the server status page for some of these. Keep going down. And it will tell us, hey, for this Onion Service, keep going down, keep going down. Um, for this Onion Service, it's running all of these domains, and some of the domains are actually on the, the Surface Web, which was neat. So you have Surface Web things to research as well as other things. You want to scroll down a little bit further? Sure. Right there. There we go. So in this in this one, uh, you can see where the two is, where the V hosts are. Um, there are some uh, .de sites as well as some other sites. And this is all what the EPI, EPLC, dot, 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 onion site is running on. So um, again, just trying to 
use these normal information disclosure vulnerabilities that we've been seeing in web apps for many years. And because systems aren't hardened on, hardened on the dark web sometimes, we can get that leaked information and have fun. I know I've definitely seen uh, server status pages on the dark web before. Absolutely. Yeah. And without yeah. even, you know, one of my quick ways to find them um, is to use some of these archive sites that are on the regular web, like onion.to, whatever, just um, doing a site colon, whatever the dark web address is, um, yeah. Yeah. .to, and then yeah. you might And that uses the Tor to web uh, proxy. Yeah, some of those proxies. Mm -hmm. yeah. They'll help you find these pages. Justin, were you going to say something? Yeah, I guess the other cool thing, too, is that if you use a onion scan, you can feed it a whole bunch of hidden service addresses, and it will automatically check for mod status and others. Mm -hmm. And then uh, onion scan also has a little web app called the correlation lab. So what you can do is you can scan thousands or tens of thousands of hidden services, go into the correlation lab, click on the mod status tag, and it'll basically give you a list of pretty much pre-populated de-anonymized hidden services or unless their mod status is only showing up for local hosts, then you don't get the real IP address. Um, but onion scan is, uh, it is still one of those tools that, um, that like I'll use for any large scale stuff. Uh, it's also worth mentioning uh, Hyperion gray that builds a bunch of dark web tools and they also do the, uh, they also do the dark web map. So they're doing a lot of really cool work in this space as well, but I loved your article for sure. Thanks, buddy. Yeah, and, and Onion Scan, that's what the Fresh Onions website is kind of built off of, right? Or um, they, oh. they use a version of that? Uh, no, so so Fresh Onions actually, they have their own method for doing it. And, I, and I'd mentioned it in the chat um, that you can actually download Fresh Onions and deploy it. So if you use DigitalOcean or Amazon or whatever, you can actually deploy a, a Fresh Onions uh, server yourself. It'll do all the crawling. It'll even bring up that you know, uh, uh, matrix looking web interface, all of that for you. Um, it's a bit tricky to get going. There's been some, uh, some spin-off projects where they've tried to make the configuration a little easier, um, but they don't use onion scan underneath because I think that fresh onions was actually built before onion scan was released. If I remember correctly. Okay. Thanks man. Because the fresh onion site has, uh, that that correlation engine, that's what made me think of it because if you dive into one of these onion uh, hidden services or onion services, it will show you, hey, these are all the other pages where the SSH key has been found or this is all the other services where we found links or Bitcoin addresses and also um, pretty cool. All right, two different ways of uh, checking out the dark web. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay, so next up we have a tweet from Rory Stolzenberg. And I know that um, Dutch, you had posted this and said that you know I had already noticed some of the creepy stuff on Nextdoor. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it was just me remembering you telling me that, that you, you tried this. And I've tried it within the Netherlands, but it's not so popular over here. But it's still a, a real valuable app to look into if you want to know uh, uh, people's names, email addresses, phone numbers, uh, profile pictures, because people, it's like a citizens policing app kind of <laughs> thing people join uh, the platform and they will share uh, things that are going wrong in their <laughs> neighborhood and everybody will and um, what's uh, what's nice you can join each and every neighborhood you want to it's not it's like geo bound based on your gps location you can yep. log into virtually every neighborhood you want to and i've looked into some especially into the united states and it's very popular over there so it could be really valuable for open source intelligence or online investigative work so it's just someone pointing it out and i was like oh yeah i almost forgot about it people should know yeah i want to point out again for those who are going to be listening on the podcast this is nextdoor.com and the nextdoor.com slash map and it kind of shows where your neighbors are and who is on nextdoor and who's not on nextdoor um when Nextdoor first started, privacy definitely was not their first thought. And there, you know, there's fields in your profile and however many you fill out, that kind of goes out there. Um, you can lock your stuff down so that you're only your close neighborhood can see it. But if you have stuff in there, you're close in, whatever they consider your close in neighborhood can see everything that you've put in there. Uh, kind of opposite of that, Ring, I don't know if you guys, anybody here has a Ring doorbell. Ring has their neighbor's app. 
and their neighbor's app is very privacy focused by, by default. You get in there and you're a user number, whatever, you pretty much have to personally type, hey, I'm Kirby and I live next door to you in the comments in order for somebody to know who you are. Um, of course, when you post your, you know, your video from your Ring app, <laughs> people might be able to like, tell who you are based on what you know, they see from your, from your Ring camera. Um, but you don't even have to have the Ring camera to get on their neighbor's app now. Okay. Right. Well, yeah, next door has been good for uh, business intelligence as well, um, especially for people developing in certain uh, areas, just to go through and kind of see what the buzz is or kind of take a general pulse of a neighborhood or something else like that. Uh, so in the U.S., I've used it several times for um, clients in real estate and in um, like business intelligence type stuff, moving into different markets. So next door is, is, has been a secret of mine for a little while. I've, I've, I've liked using it, actually. All right. Any other comments on next door? Nope. All right, let's see. We've got Brenna Smith, B Smith underscore 1853. She has published her own tutorial um, to Bell and Cat because she was um, inspired, I guess, by Bell and Cat. And now we have uh, her tutorial over on Bell and Cat's site. It's called Tracking Illicit Transactions with Blockchain, a guide featuring Mueller. Yeah, I wanted to point this out, uh, not specifically uh, the blog post she made, which is awesome, but mm -hmm. um, it was her, her tweeting out uh, the amount of buzz and it gained and people spinning off of her blog, doing additional research, making new blogs inspired by her blog. It was just, this is just typical to, to, to us and curious people. Mm -hmm. Someone makes great blog and other people get inspired by it and f uh, figure out new things. Uh, just take a block step by step and learn from it. I thought mm -hmm. it was really inspiring to see how uh, Brenna in this case made a block for Bell and Cat and people picked it up and learned from it and even made it better in some ways if, by making new git pulls and uh, new git pushes to certain scripts. So. I think it's awesome that the community um, does this and picks it up so good. Yeah, I, I'm loving how people are kind of bouncing off each, each other and especially just even in our own group, Ocean and Curious. Yeah. And for me, the, the, the blog specifically was interesting because the tracking um, illicit transactions through a blockchain is always a hard job and someone trying to explain how she did it in this case it's mm -hmm. you always learn something because the blockchain yeah it's it's a it's a hard case to, to crack when you want to trace money especially through a decentralized system i am actually speaking on that on tuesday at the techno security conference in san diego i'm talking about tracking on, on blockchain and this is going to be one of those very few conferences where i actually have to make slides so what i mm -hmm. might do and those slides into a blog post for us and curious after cool. and then i'll kind of refer back to hers because we don't do things that quite the same at all so yeah. it'll be interesting okay. looking forward to both of your blogs and to compare them and learn from them right cool. i'll okay. also throw in a, a plug for nick for uh book on investigating cryptocurrencies is mm -hmm. very good if you haven't picked it up yet and you want to learn how to do this stuff and some of the underlying theory uh it is very good his last name is spelled f-u-r-n-e-a-u-x thank you you know i was hesitating there for that yeah. uh, it's right it's here very good. yeah go. exactly it's it's on amazon and, and nick is uh, an incredibly smart guy and very uh very cool oh amazon's down no it's my uh Apparently my <laughs> VPN is not so happy right now. <laughs> anyway, I just thought I would say that because I learned a ton from this book. It was amazing. I just read it recently. It was awesome. So while you're doing that, Kirby, we have a question mm -hmm. from one of our users or one of our listeners. It says, uh, could some, anyone please give me some ideas, suggestions on how to automate dark web intelligence gathering using Python? Now, since oh, we, have dark we, web, <laughs> yeah, we have dark web and Python, there's only one guy I can think of to, that would have an opinion on that. Ginsburg. No, no, no. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> Justin. Let me tell you uh, a story. No. Yeah, let me tell you a story. <clears throat> <laughs> what do you think, Justin? Uh, what, automating dark web intelligence, and it's a pretty broad 
uh, swath of, of, of OSINT there? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing, like if you're new to coding or you're new to automation at all, is like try to find a tool. And we already talked about Onion Scan and Hyperion Gray. Um, try to find some tools that you can kind of look at, um, you know, do some scanning with, and then think about, you know, how would I want to do this differently or where can I plug additional data in? Um, start very slow, start very small. Don't try to think of things in terms of, you know, I want to learn how to map the entire darknet and build this big graph and, and uh, show it off on a blog post. Um, start very simply by first figuring out how do I get Python to talk to a hidden service? Um, how do I make this happen? What stuff do I need to deploy? Do I need to learn some Linux first? Um, so those are the things where you can start. And then there's a ton of resources out there. There's, books, there's training. I mean, just Googling Python and OSINT, you're going to come up with more than enough reading to keep you busy for weeks on end. Uh, but I always, if it's something new, even for myself, I tend to try to find a tool that already does something, run it, kind of observe how they do it, think about the problem, and then start very small and kind of Lego building block my way up to my actual goal. Yeah, I think there, there's a follow-up here. It says, was implemented to gathering to gather active onion links and grabbing websites, screenshots, et cetera, but need more crazy ideas. My suggestion uh, is uh, one, obviously listen to, to the Justin, but also, you know, the, the, the web servers that are on the dark web, at least on Tor network are Apache, Nginx, light HTTP. These are the same web servers that are on the internet and the vulnerabilities and the other types of information disclosure vulnerabilities that we've seen on the regular surface web pertain. It's just a different mechanism to find them. So again, if you're looking for different things you could do on those servers or, or um, information you could gather, my suggestion is, is pick, some, pick a few sites or pick, pick a few different types of server platforms look into them more deeply on the surface web and what you can do using uh, different CVEs or vulnerabilities or whatever, and then go ahead and move over to the dark web and try it out. I think it's fair to mention, uh, Micah, you also did a blog post a while back about uh, was the, so scanning the, the the dark web links, whatever, and then taking screenshots was eyewitness. Eyewitness, that's right. Yeah, I know we've talked about that before, whatever. But if screenshots are something that the you the the person is asking the question, whatever, that that's something to look up as well. We can put that in the in the show notes. Um, yeah. But that that just goes out. It will take you know the screenshot from the the main the landing page, you know, the port eighty scan, whatever, and then kind of pop it back into you know somewhere you can review it and stuff, and then see kind of what it's about. You just have to watch out for that. Yeah. yeah <laughs> I was just going to say, say yeah, I, just, I dropped yeah. out for a little bit, but you definitely want to watch out taking screenshots off of it. <laughs> yep. Yep. Just for child headers, sexual abuse the is, really the big, uh, is the big thing. Sure. So, yeah. so that's, uh, yeah. that's the, the big thing to worry about. Because if you take a screenshot, uh, just so you most of you are aware, if you take a screenshot of uh, child sexual abuse and it ends up on your server, you've actually violated the law in a number yep. of different ways. So uh, you do not want to explain that in court later, even though it's innocent. Um, but definitely that post is awesome. Like screenshots are an awesome way to see what's going on in those hidden services. Just be very careful. Yep. Yep. Be targeted and um, otherwise grab your headers first. And I know some people who are doing something kind of like that. And what they're doing is grabbing the headers to try and see if they can't get some kind of information or maybe even just getting the HTML instead. Don't grab, don't get a screenshot. Get, grab your HTML and see what you can get from that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Because there may be some flavor text in there that definitely indicate what's what's in there and, yeah. you know, how questionable it is or whatever. Or mm -hmm. even just the, the JPEG, you know, kind of the, the name of it and stuff like that. Whatever. So, yeah. Yeah, and Fresh Onions actually has a stop list of, uh, of um, child abuse keywords built into it. So you can actually go look at that stop list, and that's a great place to start that if any of those keywords appear in a hidden service, don't take a, don't take a screenshot of it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So while you move on to the next tab, um, one of the things that I want to say is welcome to Technizet, who's online via the phone. All right. Hi, Technoset. Sorry, I had to get rid of some of these tabs because the little thing for the sharing screen pops up Hi, on top. Here. 
Hey. Yay. Hi. I'm not on phone. I'm on, on laptop as we speak. But uh, my camera is turned off. All right. Welcome. Thank you. Sorry um, for running late, everyone. No okay. problem. All right, so we're on another Twitter post. This one is by Bell Bites, B-E-L-L-E-B-Y-T-E-S, Elise. She has made an interactive OSINT guide. She says the checklist is functional and the links bring you to command examples like the ones she uses herself. And we brought up her guide, and I have to tell you, this is probably the prettiest <laughs> of one of the, of the websites out there right now, <laughs> as far as... Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah I, I, I didn't bring this up, I didn't post this, whatever, but I did reach out to her and say if it was gonna be updated and stuff. Um, it's a really neat kind of uh, uh, basic overview for the site. It does have a lot of the stuff. It obviously doesn't have everything in there because there's no way to go through and encapsulate everything, but it's, mm -hmm. it's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I read it also. I think it's a really good getting started um, post. It, it has a bit of all, and you can go in depth as much as you want to when you click on those links and you end up on someone's Git or someone's little script. But in basics, it's just pointing you in the right direction to good sources and resources. And yeah, I liked it. It was just another great initiative of someone putting some time and effort into teaching others. Yes, definitely. Really nice site. Next up, we've got another Twitter one, I underscore intelligence. Um, yeah. This is to the Search Engine Colossus. Mm -hmm. uh, it popped up uh, on my timeline. And, um, well, Mika and I are often discussing um, um, international resources for uh, searching and this um, when you click on the, the the shortened link you will end up by uh, in search engines by country and well that's really uh, worth it because when you look into the news of Andorra or Guam or India um, just click one of those links and you will get to new sites or uh, search engines, uh, specific, country specific, which uh, is really useful because sometimes you'll have that specific case and you need to know which are the most common search engines for a certain country and it will point you to them. I must say some of these are a bit outdated, but overall um, it does a fairly decent job. And it's a great repository for looking into country-specific search engines. I remember this thing. This thing has been out there for a long time. It's not just country-specific. It's, kind of, it's kind of a directory of all sorts of search engines yeah. as well. So just wanted to point it out because yeah. people tend to forget the old ones, but the old ones tend to be really good also. Mm -hmm. Username permutation generator. How about that one, Micah? Is that you? No, this, that this, this is me. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. I found this one really interesting and funny because um, this is what annoys me all of the time when, let's say, I have the username of Justin or Techniset or Mika. You can spell it in numerous ways, and someone's username can be spelled in several ways. Uh, uh, Last name first, first name last, date of birth first, uh, you name it, it's there. But you got to think of all of those different types of spelling from the top of your dome. And this tool um, does it for you. You just feed it an initial name or username and it will um, like juggle all other different um, ways to spell that username, which can be really useful for you to doing those next invest investigative steps and looking into the name. It may be Mika has another profile with his birthday on it. Uh, I don't. I don't. No? I use your birthday. Oh, and this no, uh, main role. <laughs> so I thought it was, it, it's not, it's just a neat little script in Python to, to help you out. And, and I can not, see that it would be useful because um, I know that the, some tools don't have the same username requirements. Like some won't allow the underscore, things like that, or a dot. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's actually a bunch of websites that will do this email permutation and and they'll generate like I just put one in the chat, the email permutator dot com. Uh, I'm not that I'm recommending it. I haven't done research as to who owns it. But the idea is that you can go ahead and, and get a huge number of, of different emails or usernames uh, that are using some kind of permutation. So go. Cool. Yeah. All right. Cool. Anything that helps. Yes. All right, we have a question from BNA087, Natalie Bushman. Um, any tips on how to find the creation date of an Instagram or of another person? Tool, uh, gettip.socials doesn't work anymore, and so she asked for maybe over some curious. And I can see that she did get a response from Stephen, Stephen C. is here, saying um, that he actually uses a Google dork where he goes back through time to see the first time that the page uh, – the Instagram post shows up. I do want to point out that Google misses whole chunks of Instagram. So this will be the first time maybe that they actually posted, but that Google might have missed that. So I don't think that that's going to be too exact. Anybody have a tool that gets the um, creation date for Instagram? How about the API? Uh, is this the creation date of the user account or of the actual mm -hmm. posts? No, I think of the user account. So I checked in the tools that I use that pull from the API. So for example, helper tools uh, for Instagram does not grab that. Okay. No, um, I, I, I can... Sorry, sorry, go ahead, Sector. Yeah, I've been looking into this uh, somewhere mid last year and I was actually ready to build a tool to do the same thing. Um, I was going to uh, automatically create accounts every month if it was possible because it is actually um, directly connected to the unique identifier, the uh, unique ID behind the uh, account. Uh, it is in chronological order. I did find that out, but without uh, having uh, knowledge about certain ideas and creation dates, you can tell was created. So, I so think I know this is a project to project. the game for us. Yeah. Yeah, that, that was still uh, on hold. <laughs> yeah, so looking at the user ID would m be my suggestion too. As mm -hmm. I'm listening to what the sector is telling, I can also imagine that it might be of influence if you, for instance, uh, create an Instagram account with your Facebook ID. Does the ID of your Facebook account becomes your Instagram account ID, or I don't know. But you can see at the Facebook IDs, they're in a chronological order as well, and the higher the number the probably is. But I don't know if there's any tool compatible of giving you the exact date an Instagram account was created, no. All right, so let's get another question, this time from, um, I'm a, Hand it to you, Micah, because this one was asked you via That's DM, right. I believe. Yes, uh, I'm going to mess up the name here. Sapientia Sec um, asked the question. Uh, do you have the question that was asked? Yeah, hang on, I'll find it here. Okay, so it was um, following on the user agent strings, whether canary tokens fall within that category too, and what else within OSINT could be, they be used for? So it so must be some conversation you had about the user agents? Yeah, so I did a, a quick 10 minute tip video on uh, user agent strings and, and what we use, use them for. And I think this was a reaction to that. Um, mm -hmm. we, use, we use user agent strings for a lot of things. And some of them are to keep ourselves kind of blending in with the normal people. Uh, some of them are to make ourselves stand out. And some of them are for exploitation, or um, we can use user agent strings to appear as other things. Uh, when I was doing web hacking, one of the things that we used to use user agent strings for was to get past the um, registration walls, not paywalls. We weren't stealing services or anything like that, but if you go ahead and look at, uh, there, there were some new sites that made you register for free account in order to, to gain access to the data that was on the site. But if you went to Google, Google had a cache of it. So what we could do is change our user agent string to be that of the Google search bot, the Google spider bot, and it would magically just let us right into the site. Um, so there's other tricks uh, with user agent strings like that. Uh, other people have ideas about user agent strings? 
Well, he said um, he's asking about the canary token, and of course, you get it from your canary from some canary tokens, probably most. Yeah. Um, so, so you can use the ways you discovered by grabbing it um, using canary tokens. And that, um, I think, is what we're going to do as far as a skill tonight because I saw the, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. Okay. Cool. Question, the second question for you was one from CryptoGhost. He, he says, is it possible after a crime is committed to find a criminal by his phone who made a Wi-Fi or Bluetooth connection at the scene of the crime is it possible to track and locate a phone of a missing teenager by email address or phone number? So the first one, I had some law enforcement people in my class, and you know, if you have a copy of the the person's the suspect's phone, and you can do a digital forensic dump, then yeah, you can look at what Wi-Fi access points the phone's connected to, and sometimes you can find when they did that too. So you have not only locate or what access point, but what time, what signal strength, um, and then. Of course, you can always, uh, if you are law enforcement, you can get that from non-open source means via search warrants from the, the carriers. Um, other people have ideas about the Wi-Fi and the and, and location? Definitely. Well, not, necessarily, uh, the, not necessarily the Wi-Fi, but I can imagine that if you're using uh, an Android phone, Google is probably tracking where you are, but then you probably need to subpoena Google asking if they can see what the most recent location is of that missing teen or missing person. Yeah, yeah and also keep in mind some uh, routers only keep a log for a certain, a certain amount of time. So when you want to grab those, that information from the router itself, you sometimes it's best to act quickly. There was something else with the location of the phone. Sorry, Kirby. There was, and I don't know specifically what it was, what, but I think it was an article a couple months back with Judd Cox where he was talking about giving a bounty hunter $300 to go through and locate his phone. I'm getting all fuzzy. I don't know. Um, and that was a service that was given to LEO and uh, bounty hunters to go through and do geolocating for, for the active phone carriers. Um, and so I know that that service is out there and some of it is on the dark web as well. Some of that location service based stuff. Um, but so it is possible if you have the, the telephone number, if you know the carrier and it's not a, my pseudo or a, you know, a Google, uh, voice number or something like that. If you actually have the direct number from the carrier, um, there is a way to go through and ping it. Even if the phone's off, um, even if for some reason, sometimes the phone is dead, uh, there is still battery connectivity and stuff. Um, there also was an article a while back about pings from cell phone towers and Wi-Fi's, uh, Wi-Fi signals to go through and to track a phone. Even if it's not doing the connection, it's still reaching out to go through and see what connections are out there. Um, and so there are some more technical things that you can go through and do, but a lot of that's kind of either high height level with uh, rogue devices, um, you know, setting up a rogue tower or a rogue Wi-Fi um, just for pings. But um, that's all I can remember right now off the top of my head for that stuff. Is it, um, I just posted in the chat the article about I received $300 from a motherboard from Vice journalist who uh, gave him the $300 to track his phone. Is that the article you were talking about? I just yep, posted yeah, it just in the talks. chat. Yep, yep, back in January. I just pulled it up yeah. too. That's the same yep. one, yeah. Yeah. And, and supposedly the, the, the bigger privacy implications of this type of thing is that, uh, especially with T-Mobile and AT&T, they had sworn off being able to go through and to release this information for sale. Um, it's always going to be available to law enforcement, things like that, for tracking and um, other, other you know, very, very specific needs. But they had sworn off, I guess, last year in 2000. 17, 2018, saying, hey, we're never going to go through and give this information back out. And lo and behold, it was something that popped up just recently. So, Surprise. yeah. yeah, yeah. Sorry, I was trying to click that straight from the chat to bring it up, but for some reason, it's not letting me do that. So I wasn't able to bring the article right up. Um, It'll be in the it, show notes. We'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, it will be in the show notes. Cool. I just posted it too. Um, yeah, but... It's, it's, something, it's something that is out there. 
it, it, that would be interesting to go through and see from a Bluetooth connection or a, um, you know, like an NFC, you know, if somebody had their, their pay phone or like Apple pay, Android pay, that type of stuff, whatever, or even Bluetooth, if they had Bluetooth open, um, if there was like connections that were just probing to go through and see if you could do uh, like a map of your activities through that, that would be an interesting experiment to go through and kind of run through. Cool. <laughs> let's go back. Let's go back to Twitter. Uh, I have uh, Jay Davis up here. Oh, and now I just lost that as well. Here we go. He has a question. Does this thread mean the phone number search vector is back? Haven't had a chance to check yet, but does anyone let me know? And the thread has to do with Facebook adding the phone number for Q to it, say, being only for security. Now it can be searched theoretically, and there's no way to be disable that. You know, I'm going to guess that this is not searchable, at least not, I mean, it's, I don't think anything's changed inside Facebook is what I mean. So the question here is, um, the idea here is that Facebook, if you add a number for two-factor authentication for security reasons on Facebook, it can be searched and you can't disable that. Um, now, if you put a phone number into Facebook, there's a place where you can say you can't search it uh, if you are not friends. So if your, your friends can always search the number you have in there. If you delete that number, your friends can't search that number. Um, I don't know if you guys want to test it, uh, but I so, think just, I'm going to guess nothing has changed. I think one way around that is um, is becoming a marketer because one of the things that they do allow their marketing and advertisers to do is to take a list of phone numbers or a list of email addresses and send a message out to people. And I would imagine if it says, hey, this phone number is not, not good anymore, then mm -hmm. you know that's a problem. Or you know you could uh, always you know plant something with an image in it that pulls from your website or something like that, so that you if it does go out to the right account, you can um, you can get them to contact you and stuff. Um, but yeah, as far as searching for a phone number and getting back, oh, that's Dutch Osink guy. Uh, I'm not sure that that's doable. Okay, D I Cook thirty four, D I Cook. Salient remember to consider not just the overt data, but the metadata you may be sharing with other parties online and what intelligence they may glean from it. And she's got a link to a consumerreports.org um, talking about how photos hidden EXIF data exposes your personal information. So if you don't give away your personal information yourself, like for example, me, uh, <laughs> your photos might give it away instead. <laughs> we've known this for a while you know we've i we've all had targets that are extremely security aware or privacy focused and it's hard to find stuff so you 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 widen the circle you wider than the aperture you look at their colleagues you look at their friends you look at their family members that may not be as security aware one of them or two or five or ten of them are connected to this weird account with a weird name or something like that and then you pivot in you're like ah there's pictures of the target and all Hey, M.W. Osen said he's got a blog article of the, on um, finding phone numbers through, uh, through Facebook. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pop him in here, so, uh, his blog article, so we can let him know as well. Good. Cool. So let's we'll put it in the show notes, too, for those of you that are on the podcast or listening to the podcast. Yeah. Uh, Justin, since you are, this is your first time on here, we're going to ask that you type your social security number and your credit card number into the chat. Uh, it's yeah. just two a credit card numbers, two-factor. Yeah, and I also, need, I also need blood type. No, no, for asking for a friend. Yeah, no problem. Just yeah, yeah. Cool. kidney cool, 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 cool. this all together for you. Okay, excellent. What else we have, Kirby? Oh, South by Southwest. Are we going to talk about the conference? Oh yeah, I am. Um, just a second. Yeah, so um, I spoke at South by Southwest. Okay, so I, I spoke at South by Southwest. I don't know, twenty ten or twenty eleven, something like that. It was a great time. The Conference is really huge. Um, I know that there's a lot of people who think, oh, yeah, it's too big for, you know, for it to be fun anymore, but it's definitely, uh, it's definitely a good time. And there's, you know, a ton of different people, and I, I'm reminded of it because it's going on right now, and I have some friends there who are attending every party and kind of showing all the fun stuff going on. And I just wanted to highlight this and let people know, hey, you know, if you want to speak at South by Southwest, how you do it and there's a there's a process to it the um requests the um cfp sort of thing the request for papers or uh pitches 
is in June usually every year. I think last year that it was in July. So late June, July, that's when you got to think of it. But there's a closing date and it's pretty short. So you have like maybe two weeks, three weeks to pitch something in there. Then it goes through an internal committee and then goes to a vote, a public vote. And in August is usually the public vote and everybody kind of votes on it. You don't find out for a while. The first people to find out will find out some stuff in November. Most of the people don't find until out until January, um, December, January. And um, it's a really good time. And I was thinking, hey, that's something maybe we could think about doing next year for Ocean and Curious. I know that we have some, um, you know, worldwide members who might not be able to come in during that time, or maybe they will. Uh, but we could also possibly bring them by satellite and, uh, you know, see what happens. Well, but also, awesome. the public watching this, who wants, who's interested in these kind of conferences, it's a good time, and they do take a lot of different kind of technology or social good or government kind of topics. There's a lot of topics for the interactive. Cool. Has anybody attended it? Anyone else on this? Um, chat here or any of our viewers my, my brother actually sent to me today from south by he's he's there he sent me a picture of a belling a, a homeless person holding a belling cat poster of all things yeah wow. so there's a lot of people get employed to do very strange things out there and that's probably <laughs> one, of the normal, one of the more normal things that happens yeah, yeah that's crazy are they out like, there uh, not that I'm aware of, but it, it was just more, he's like, this is interesting. Like, uh, the guy, I guess was yeah talking about like various things and Bellingcat was one of the things he felt was like something that was good for, you know, everyone that there's an organization like this doing this type of stuff. So I thought it was pretty interesting. I thought it was even better that my brother picked it up and was like, Hey, check this out. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't doubt that they're out there. I would not doubt that they'd be out there or that somebody would be there, even maybe not them, but somebody else saying, hey, this is sort of this sort of stuff you need to pay attention to and talking about Bellingcat. I think they're airing their uh, documentary there. I read oh, uh, Christian yeah. Trebert from Bellingcat tweeting that it will be featured there. It's a two-hour documentary uh, about the, the work Bellingcat does. So mm -hmm. I think it's that. Has it been yeah. translated yeah, I don't know in English that. yet? Mm -hmm. Has it been translated to English? Yeah. Because that documentary was in Dutch, right? Uh, well, well part Dutch is. Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Most okay. of it was in English, but there were some parts of it in Dutch. There was um, the head of the police who was sp uh, speaking was in Dutch, and Christian also said something in Dutch, I guess. Um, you can view the documentary on the uh, on a Dutch website, but you probably get don't get the English subtitles, so you probably can better wait until it's full English. Um, I had a question from a user uh, whether or not I will make a post about the talk I did at the OSINT Summit, and yes, I will um, post on that. Yeah, the slides for that are kind of TED-ish, so I will... I'll make a post on, and basically that topic was how to become, uh, do OSINT full-time and possibly start your own business using that. Another conference that I'm going to speak at, uh, uh, that was announced just the other day because International Women's Day, they announced me as the first speaker uh, accepted to the Osmosis 2019 conference. Um, I don't know if any of you guys are going to Osmosis this year. I'm so trying. I'm really hoping I can make it. Well, my paper got, re got rejected, so I won't be there. I believe oh, no. Aww. Yeah. You still can attend it. Uh, I'm, I'm, if I come up with the money <laughs> somehow. <laughs> nah. that, that was really an awesome, awesome post that, uh, that they put up and how they used you know, the International Women's Day to go through and to announce Kirby and stuff. So that was, that was really, really cool to see. Um, I know that a lot of us kind of look up to you in regards to the things you've been doing and the work that you've done, the help that you've given all the community and stuff. So that was, that was very, very just, um, it, was, it was really cool to see. Thank you. Yeah. And I, I was very happy to see the video as well. It was really pretty cool. So, um, yeah. hopefully I'll see a lot of other people there. Yeah. It, it looks like a really good conference I mean, I, from what I can see from it, from, from here in the Netherlands. I, I'm, I'm, it's one of the, the conferences I really want to attend to. Me too. 
That's that. Uh, this year I have a conflict, but next year I'm I'm submitting a CFP, and if I don't get in, I'll be yes. attending as a as a uh, attendee. Uh, Justin, will you be able to make it down there to Orlando this year? I'm not sure. We'll see. That's pretty. It's always close to uh, a conference that I attend every year in Ottawa called Countermeasure. So uh, we'll see if I can. Uh, we'll see if I can make it. Um, anybody else have any, have any conferences they want to kind of say that they're going to be at this year? This coming year? Layer 8. Layer 8, yes. Let's talk about Layer 8. Yeah. That one's coming. Yeah, I just submitted to Layer 8 as well. Um, so, Kirby's feeling like uh, pretty uh, adventurous uh, today. <laughs> this is like the best conference ever. Yeah, Lair A is Social Engineering and OSINT uh, up in Rhode Island, a one-day conference. Uh, Patrick Laverty actually was down at the OSINT Summit uh, last last week or two weeks ago. Super cool to meet him. Uh, he was mm -hmm. so, yeah. so cool. I was impressed. I, you know, I, I've talked with him back and forth on Twitter, and he just seems like a chill guy. In person, he is just so nice. Um, and uh, so, yeah, really excited about the uh, – the, the, uh, the, the conference and, and seeing just all the cool things that they're going to do up there in Rhode Island. How about any other ones? Uh, 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 I think it's fairly cheap, right? Isn't Layer 8 a, a really cheap to attend? Because some, some other conferences are, are getting pricey and pricier by the day. But this is what I looked from it. I think it's like 15 yeah. or 50 bucks a day or something. I think I bought a ticket at like $55 or something like that. It was yeah. but that's very pretty awesome also. Yeah, yep. yeah so between 40 to 100 so I guess it depends yeah, okay. on. And that's important to me student. because the Dutch are cheap, right? You know, that's what we do. <laughs> <laughs> Speak for yourself, Dutch. No. <laughs> Tell them technically that. <laughs> oh, is there another tab that you have open, Kirby? Please switch. Uh, of course. I, I want to give everybody, give everybody a chance to get other conferences yeah. in, but I am speaking on Tuesday at the Techno Security Digital Forum forensics conference on Tuesday. And that is again on, on um, Bitcoin attribution. Have you, have you been to that conference before? I have not. In fact, I think this is the first year they're holding it in San Diego as well. They started off in Myrtle beach and now they're kind of spreading out. There's three locations now, Myrtle beach, San Diego, and somewhere else. I know there's a newer InfoSec uh, con. I think it's in Omaha. It's called kernel con. Uh, oh. I've submitted to that as well. I'm going to check that out. Yeah, Colonel Con. Mm -hmm. Out in Omaha. And this is the first year for this one as well. Um, I know that there are some bigger type names that are at least going. Um, I know that they've all submitted as well. And uh, like this is trying to make it out there, and he is uh, kind of big in the space. Uh, Dave Kennedy also is talking about trying to get out there. So um, this is one that I think, um, you know, with. DerbyCon kind of going away. This being the last year of that, there are some other ones that may try to replace that. Um, so this is this is a newer one that may not a lot of people might know about. And then besides Kansas City, like I said, besides yes. Kansas City, out in April, April twenty sixth and twenty seventh, which is uh, the third year we've been doing that one. Um, like I said, I'm running the OSINT Village up for there, and also doing some workshops and stuff. So I get to teach this some people, which is cool. Um, looking forward to that. Yeah, it's coming up soon. Yeah, it's scary. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else have any that they're going to soon? Soonish. Uh, I'm going to attend the Hack in the Box in Amsterdam. It's oh, a cool. Early conference. It's a cool one. So Hack in the Box Amsterdam. All right. Yeah. Nice. And that when's that going to be? Oh, May. See, yeah, that's yeah, that's awesome. That's soon enough. And it's, have, it's a really good one. They have really, they have lots of workshops and and and, and classes also. So it's it's a it's a really for me. It's it's one of the first conferences I ever attended years ago, and it's I always like this one because for me it's the old the old school one, and I can see lots of people I know, and that's pretty cool. That's awesome. Hey, we do have a question over in the Q&A, which kind of opens up that we're going to start asking our guest, Justin, some questions. Uh, does anybody want to kind of take a look at that, the open questions? I think this is actually a follow-up to the questions that uh, 
that uh, said earlier. I'm gonna mess, uh, yeah, I'm going to mess up your name. I'm sorry. Um, that that they answered uh, asked earlier about Python tools automating OSINT and um, the dark web or just other places. You know, the question is is where can we use OSINT stuff in C search SOC teams? Uh, give more ideas and suggestions in IR forensics. Uh, this is for just an uh, example like Twitter gathering, malware, bulk lookups, IPs, um, and using Python. There are a huge number of resources out there that do a lot of things, whether it's Spiderfoot or whether it's Recon NG or whether it's um, just py custom Python tools or other things that that can do help out blue teams and all. But let's turn it over to the Mr. Sites. Uh, I mean, your your thoughts on on blue teamers that are using OSINT? Yeah, I mean, I most of my time was spent in offensive security, so uh, it's uh, it's a bit trickier for me to reframe it. But I think that much in the same way um, as Micah had mentioned, you know, tools like Spiderfoot, Recon NG, um, Scumbler, which is from Netflix, um, yeah. these types of tools will allow you to kind of you know, punching keywords, accounts, or other things that you either want to monitor or that you want to collect things on a schedule. I know Spiderfoot HX, which is kind of the high availability um, web front end that, uh, that he's built, that Steve has built, is a place where that you can very easily do this. And then I guess the, the big question is, is that in your SOC or um, if you're part of a CERT team, is looking at how can we take the machine-driven data that we're looking at in Elk or Splunk or some other tool, and how do we enrich that data using this external OSINT, right? So how do we begin to kind of pull stuff in from VT or um, pull in even social media stuff, and, and how do we actually match that up to data that we're collecting and acting on already? Um, so it's about doing a bit of requirements gathering first because just piling more data on top of data you have is – not necessarily going to give you any insights. It's about kind of being a selective and how can you enrich the data that you have? That's the question you should be asking. So whatever data you have today, how can you enrich that with additional data and then try to find tools that will do it for you? And where a lot of the, the Python scripting stuff comes in is I don't rebuild tools that already exist. I try to build stuff where there's a gap where maybe two tools don't overlap and I can write code to bridge the two of them or collect information that uh, no other tool is doing in a way that I need it to. Um, but again, do the requirements gathering, figure out what data you have, figure out how you can enrich it, and then see if there isn't a tool that can help you uh, do that automatically. Found advice. Justin, I have a question. How, how much of the stuff do you, the, how, how often do you find yourself writing custom tools to go through and fit the, I don't want to say the mission design, but like whatever you're, whatever you're trying to tackle, how much of that is actually is stuff that you can use that's readily available versus you know, custom stuff that you actually, you know, spend time to go through and develop. I mean, it's a, it's tricky because often what I find is like where I do need to build a tool. It always seems like I do some Googling, I do some hunting around, I don't find anything. I write the tool and then like, you know, I'll be talking to Dutch or Micah or, you know, uh, Mike Bazell has got kind of like this massive encyclopedic knowledge of like everything that's out there for tools and stuff. And they'll be like, oh, yeah, there's a, you know, this dude wrote this thing like two years ago. You're way behind uh, uh, on this. Um, so often, you know, I try to find stuff. Uh, but uh, this morning, for example, I'm uh, I'm doing some work that's not that's not public, might be public someday um but same thing it was like basically looking at um a platform called aleph from the occrp so that's the organized crime and corruption reporting project amazing tool this thing is one of the coolest things i've seen in a long time uh it allows it uh it allows you to bulk load documents it will automatically ocr them extract entities cross-reference them. So you can imagine if you're doing a large-scale corporate OSINT gig where you're actually trying to figure out how a company's behaving, or maybe you're in fraud analysis and you're pulling down a pile of company filings, you can actually just bulk load all those documents in uh, and it will kind of allow you to cross-reference them. Um, so this thing I'm working on with some folks is a uh, 
um, I wanted to be able to uh, pull in some unique data sources. So this morning I had to write some Python to go out and basically uh, with some Selenium go out and preserve some web pages and monitor them, PDF them, and then push them into this uh, push them into this index. There's no tool that exists to do it. Uh, but again, often you're not like I'm not kind of reinventing the wheel and I'm not flying rockets to the moon. This is very simple stuff and it's kind of building on core fundamental concepts. And that's always why I'm, you know, pushing people like just understand the basics because once you get the basics, once you can get Python to talk to the internet or you can get Python to automate a web browser, um, there's a million different tasks I've applied those very core fundamental things to, whether it's scraping Facebook, which, uh, you know, disclaimer, you should only do if you have permission. Uh, you can't see my face right now, which is great because I'm smiling. Um, <laughs> but there's, uh, there's uh, you know, whether it's scraping Facebook or whether it's preserving news articles or whatever it is, you know, once you get these core fundamental, very simple things down, you can very easily use them in a million different ways. Uh, and this project was a great example where it didn't need anything really um, robust. It just needed something very simple. So, yeah, I mean, I, I find I'm doing this a lot, like just helping people plug gaps with some automation. Hmm. That's awesome. And in addition to that, can I ask you, what does a typical week of Justin look like? What, what do you do in a typical week? Yes, sure. So um, most of my time is spent uh, running Hunchly. We have a small team. Um, so we, we spend a lot of time um, talking to customers. So, so I am on the phone a lot, oddly enough. Um, talking to customers, understanding what kind of challenges they're running into, understanding, um, you know, what laws are changing in their jurisdictions, how evidence is produced for courts, all of this stuff that's not necessarily OSINT related, but it's actually what we call the last mile for, for a lot of our customers, which is we've collected all this stuff, we need to use it in court or we need to use it when we're doing a story. So we have a lot of those discussions. Um, I still do consulting and investigative work, um, so uh, less so now, but I still have uh, clients that I do work for, which includes anything from uh, very simple, you know, vetting an executive before they join the board of directors for a company to fraud or um, other things. And then I volunteer my time, uh, what's left of my time. Um, I volunteer my time as well to some organizations, whether that's journalists, um, whether that's um, child exploitation people who need help and, and don't necessarily always have the funding to get external help. Um, and then, of course, I'm also spending time um, I, I've, uh, working on uh, helping my students with their Python questions. So uh, we, have, uh, we have a training platform, of course, uh, at Automating OSINT. We're going through a major course refresh as well. Um, we're getting rid of Python 2. Uh, we've already done work to move to Python 3, uh, expanding the course and removing chunks of the course like Instagram, which are largely useless now because you can't get access to the API in the way that we need to as investigators um so yeah that's that's generally uh that's generally what i pack into my uh my average week well thanks for saying that justin because one of the questions we had from cheerio who i think is still with us was just that is uh hey you know the the stuff that you wrote on your your automating osint website is was for python 2 is it going to be updated to python 3 and You've already mentioned that it's in the process, right? Yeah, I'm not going to update the blog posts, uh, but I certainly the, uh, but I mean, 90% for those people who are Python 3 developers, um, they take my blog posts and it's like a couple of lines of code and it just works, right? Yeah. Um, so it's not a major transition, but for us in the course, the course is getting a little long in the tooth. Um, you know, we built it originally in 2015. We, we did a couple of small uh, refreshes, um, but there's been a lot of things that have changed in the last couple of years. So we're really going to expand things and remove things and try to try to kind of match up what we see um, investigators and, and developers needing to do today. What other questions do we have for Justin's sites? Uh, so Justin, you, you've written several books, right? You've written the Gray Hat, Python, and other ones too? And Black, Black Hat, Hat, Python, yeah. Black Hat. <laughs> you ever going to write the White Hat one? 
<laughs> no, I ran out of hats. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I have no plans <laughs> to write any books right now. You know, No Starch is an amazing uh, publisher, so they're they're pretty unique in that they they have given me pretty free license in the past to to kind of you can actually see a ripped off book right there about six books into the right uh so that's actually uh, that might be a book that was um you have to look so it's interesting so sometimes if you on amazon and this is funny because this actually falls in line with my uh, plagiarism tweet that got a lot of traction last week um so there's a lot of knockoffs that no starch is battling and it sucks it sucks for everybody um, and uh, it pisses me off to no end. Not so much when my stuff is, uh, actually, I don't mind too much when my stuff's pirated. It's been pirated since day one. As soon as you have an ebook released, it's everywhere. Uh, there's little that you can do. Um, but I think that, that the interesting thing is, is what we're seeing, not only in, in terms of books, but what we're seeing in general is that people are far more brazen with plagiarism. Um, and so you have people who've been producing content for a long time, who, um, you know, people show up on the scene today and they just rip their stuff off. They put it up on their own domain. They put it up on their own blog, on their own Twitter feed. Um, and it's, it's tough to see because I think that the InfoSec community and I think the OSINT community was a spinoff of InfoSec. It was all kind of rolled together at one point and then OSINT kind of went off on its own. And it's unfortunate um, because uh, it's just... You see, I talk, to, I talk to content producers all the time. Um, people like Michael Basil's stuff is ripped off. Like his tools are ripped off. I know this because I've written some of the code for his tools. I see his tools ripped off all the time. I see people ripping off his, his flow charts. I see flow people charts, yeah. ripping, off, uh, ripping off blog posts of mine and then reposting them to like uh, membership only paid sites. Um, it's, oh, really? It's all kinds of stuff. I have people who tweet to me privately, like, here's where, you know, someone took your stuff and like stuffed it into like a, a PDF or an ebook. And, and it, it, the, the thing, I, I guess the message, what my tweet was trying to say, uh, and I'm still saying today is like, just even if you don't want to admit that you've ripped 90% of somebody's stuff off, like just put a link in the bottom of your post or somewhere, or at least just acknowledge that you, you were, you know, this is inspired by so-and-so's um, stuff because what you're going to see is that people who are producing content and sharing it with everybody, they're going to get tired of doing that and they're going to get tired of rip, getting ripped off and then nobody's going to want to publish anything. Right. And, and that's unfortunate. Or you're going to have like in the InfoSec community where people just hold on to the really good stuff until it's time to do a conference talk. Right. Because that's how you can almost guarantee that you're going to get enough publicity that it's really difficult to rip you off, even though it still happens. So that's enough about that. But it's it's a uh, it's uh, it is becoming increasingly irritating that that people are just not honoring that, that code of ethics that says, let's not rip each other off and let's support each other. I see a lot of vitriol too in, in OSINT forums and other places where I'm like, you know, this is just not, a, not gonna be healthy if we allow it. And people look up to people like Mike, they look up to you guys, they look up to me, they look up to others in the industry, and it's our job to make sure that we are saying something when we see something, right? Uh, Troy Hunt has a, a bunch of blog posts. Uh, Troy Hunt, the researcher behind Have I Been Pwned, and a whole bunch of other app application security and cybersecurity things. He's got a whole bunch of blog posts out there where people have literally taken his Pluralsight courses, recorded them while they're watching them, and then they just take that thing with the Pluralsight watermark in it and post it over on Udemy and other sites. And so you're watching the material on Udemy, and there and it says you know copyright Pluralsight, and he's like WTF? You know this yeah. is this is absolutely brazen. And Udemy is like, hey, we're a web sharing uh, file site. You know, it's it, it's all right. These are videos that somebody uploaded. We we can't review them all. And yeah. I think there's a lot of BS in that too. So yeah, yeah. And I mean, it's just like I said, there's so much positive stuff and so much learning, and and everybody collaborates so nicely. This type of stuff just taints. Uh, it taints things. So I, yeah, I just feel like we all got, can do a bit more, a better job of pointing it out when we see it and, and just not letting people, not allowing people to do it. Yeah, one, agree more. One, one other thing I would say on that, and this is 
this is somewhat in the vein of uh, maybe malicious um, plagiarism type stuff. Like I just saw like the other day, there was something for uh, OSINT framework for like Justin Rodin's site. And someone had registered a domain that was OSINT frame or framework, F-R-A-M, no E, work. And so it was a malicious link to a very well-known uh, you, you, like you, utility um, that a lot of people use because it's very visual and things like that. Um, but, you know, outside of it just being something that we should be discouraging or we should be giving, um, you know, the, the proper uh, you know, accolades to the people who do that stuff, it can also turn into, you know, the, the Bitcoin Ethereum scams of Twitter where Elon Musk is saying, hey, send me this stuff and I'll send you 10,000 back, whatever. These, these tools that are so uh, relevant in InfoSec and for OSINT specifically can also go through and be a good gateway for malicious actors to, you know, use that stuff and just do one key off or do a Unicode um, type of URL and then, you know, fish and man in the middle and things like that as well. So those, those type of things need to be up front. And, and if you're stealing ideas or you're passing around links or PDFs are bad, stuff like that, it just gives another attack vector to people who honestly want to learn the things uh, and then, you know, kind of get pwned themselves. I see a really neat open source intelligence project there, right? It's the play yep. identification of plagiarism and identification or uh, not necessarily public shaming because realistically, there's no way that we're going to send a cease and desist over to some comp or some person or their website in, in a foreign place that doesn't care about our legal system or plagiarism. That's not going to work. But, you know, there's public shaming. There's these sites known for whatever. It might be interesting to look for that kind of stuff and just, uh, you know, practice yep. our skills. Attribution.org used to do some great stuff in that, in that, but I don't, I don't think they keep it up anymore. I'm not sure. Yeah. No. They're still on Twitter, so maybe Attribution. they do. So Justin, what is a, what's something that you, that when you do it, you're really cool. I'm in OSINT, within the OSINT world, okay. Um, what is something that you really like doing? What's one of the the fun things for you to do when you you can start doing? It, you're like, yeah, I get to do this technique or that, play with that tool or that site. That's tricky because I honestly, for me, I just love digging into a story or a case period. So it's, you know, I love the fact that I'm, you know, was doing some research uh, recently and, you know, kind of fell back in love with passive total and was like, man, what an amazing tool this is. And, you know, I just find, I find that kind of thrill of the hunt, um, which I think drives most good, um, you know, open source practitioners is it's the kind of the thrill of the chase and tracking down those little threads and finding new information. And it's, it's that part that I really thoroughly enjoy. Um, and, and that's why, like, I, I guess it's, it, we're really fortunate that with, with Hunchly, we get to talk to people every single day that are doing this. So I get to live vicariously through my customers all the time. Cause I'm constantly badgering them for war stories as I'm sure I've badgered each of you here. Um, I love it. Uh, I just, I, I guess I was always wired for, for this type of work. Um, and like I, and I tell people like, you know, penetration testing is very much the thrill of the, the thrill of the hunt as well. You spend 99% of your time failing and uh, it's that 1% of the time that something works, you get somewhere, you get a foothold. Um, it's the same thing with OSINT. The, the two are very close together. It's hours and hours of mundane work that leads to these kind of pinnacles where something cool happens or you find that piece of information that closes the loop. Um, so yeah, that's for me, it's, it's just kind of, yeah, I, I, I love that stuff and, and um, I, I get completely consumed with it. Don't you think it's also not uh, sometimes OSINT is being brought a little bit more uh, sexy than it is in real? <laughs> because for me, I can spend hours, not if not days digging into something really small or specific. And after five or six days, I'm just like, well, can't find nothing. And it feels like you've lost five or six days, but you learned a lot and you investigated. And also I think um, when it comes to making intelligence, not finding answers are answers too. But mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and that's, I, you know, I tell, I, I still get lots of emails and, and DMs and stuff about like, I want to get into hacking or I want to get into OSINT. And I always tell people like, number one, like be prepared for like, you will condition yourself for failure um, because that is a huge part of, of, of doing this work is not getting discouraged. Um, every piece of information has the potential to be important, um, but you can spend days or even in the exploit development world, we would sometimes spend weeks or months on the same, you know, couple hundred lines of code trying to get something to work and ultimately have to walk away from it. And it's the same thing when you're doing OSINT work for hire, um, you have to be prepared to write reports that detail step by step how you failed, how you could not find the information you were looking for. Um, but that's, I think that's the, that's the whole thing. I mean, if you can't, um, too often, and I blogged about this a bit, talking about tenacity, and I, I mean, too often people get frustrated and they stop too early. And, and this is not OSINT, this is a general human nature thing. It's people give up on their businesses too quickly, people give up on their investigations too quickly, they give up on, you know, finding bugs too quickly. And I think persistence and some tenacity really pays off. But you're right, you can spend a very long time staring at the same data. And sometimes it's the 10th hour got you nothing, but the 11th hour got you something that you didn't see before. Um, so that's where it's, it's kind of, uh, yeah, that's, you got to be ready for a lot of failure. So Justin, somebody wrote a question, kind of a follow-up there. So somebody is uh, paying you or, or any one of us here uh, a large amount of money to go ahead and do this. So since you've done your due diligence, you've, you've d dug as deep as you can for days or weeks or whatever amount of time, and you haven't found anything that really answers their question, what they want. Uh, what kinds of language or what kind of things do you do to say, listen, I, I wasn't just wasting your money just Googling stuff. I did all these things and I failed it. So, so how do you tell your customer that? You know, you weren't able to find much. Yeah. So actually this conversation happens long before you've even, you even know what the case is about. And that's because the first conversation you should have with a customer always is that there are no guarantees and anyone who, and, and I've seen tons of PI firms say we have a 95% success rate and I can guarantee you with uh, a few thousand dollars, I could blow their success rate down into the single digits by sending them cases that are unsolvable. So the first step is making sure that you set expectations early with your customer. Number one, there is no such thing as a guaranteed solved case. Um, we have entire police agencies that would never in a million years ever say, oh, someone got killed, don't worry, uh, we, solve, we have a 100% success rate in all, of our, in all of our cases. So making sure before you have the conversation about money, before you have the conversation about NDAs and contracts, before any of that, you set your customer's expectation, which means telling them <clears throat> upfront, I can't guarantee you I'm going to find anything. What I can guarantee you is I'm going to write a report telling you exactly everything I did. Much like in security, as an OSINT contractor or an investigator, you're not necessarily always selling answers. There are times where you are selling assurance, that the assurance that you spent a lot of time and you're qualified to do this work and that you're providing a level of assurance that you're going to do what you say you did. So if you have that conversation up front and early, then anything else that flows from that means that they're already ready for a certain level of failure or at least have realistic expectations. Where things go completely off the rails is when you don't set those expectations, they've paid you ten dollars or $20,000 and you show up with a report that's two pages long that says, I didn't find anything, uh, you're going to have an unhappy customer because it's the expectation that was not set correctly at the beginning. The follow-up piece to that is that you should have paperwork in place that specifies exactly what you're going to do and what you're going to deliver for the amount of money you're being paid. So you can actually cover off in a contract that says exactly what you're going to do so that you are going to get paid at the end of it, even if you do, uh, even if you're not successful. So that all being said, those are more business tips. The, the final thing is in your report, if you, and I always tell customers this, um, you know, you're going to know whether I was successful or not based on the methodology section of my report. And the methodology section should be huge if you found nothing. 
It should detail. I checked this, I checked this, and I'm not talking about, I ran this Google identifier through Spy on Web. It has to be in language that they can understand, but what you're trying to do is describe to them all of the activities that you covered while you were doing the investigation. So that at the end of it, if there are no answers, they can read that and go, well, this looks like you were really thorough at least. It's like, yeah, I was thorough, but I didn't find what you were looking for. So that's how you can kind of, you can help with that is by building a methodology section into your report. I have lots of people who are always paranoid. Well, you know, if I tell them everything that I do, can't they just go out and do it themselves? Um, they're not going to do that. They're hiring you for a reason. They're not going to be able to replicate all of your experience and all of your training and all of those other things. It's impossible. So the more detail you can give them, the less upset they're going to be at the end when you don't have something that you can actually produce and make sure you're documenting everything you do during your investigation. So whether you want to do something manually with Snagit or you want to use a tool like Fireshot that's free, Hunchly, which obviously we run, which is a paid tool, Paliscope, which is also a paid tool. Use something, document your work so that if you ever really need to, you can back up what you're saying in your methodology section with real evidence of what you did. So hopefully that helps to kind of answer some of those questions. Um, so we have a one more question from that same user. Um, it's not for Justin, it's actually, well, it's for everyone, I think. Um, it's the, the fact that I offer a virtual inter internship and my internship is basically um, someone writes a couple of papers for me based on tools that I want them to write on. We put that um, sometimes on our blog, sometimes internal, whichever, and then um, they may get published, but they can also throw that on a resume. So the user wants to know um, if, anyone, if anyone knows anyone in Europe who would offer a similar type of resume. Not that I know of. Um, I need to ask around. That probably is, but I've never been asked this question before. So uh, I'll ask around, and if there is, I will let it know, and I'll put a link to it into the show notes, or the person in question can email or personal message me on Twitter, and we'll sort it out. All right. All right. Do we have any other questions for Justin? Well. I have a question. Uh, I always wanted to know what Justin uh, got from being a pen tester and a book writer to the developer of Hansley. What happened? What, what's your story? <laughs> what went wrong, Justin? What, yeah, what went what? wrong? <laughs> Where did things go sideways for you? <laughs> Come lay on my couch and tell me. <laughs> um, I actually, uh, it was interesting because I worked for a great company called Immunity based out of Miami Beach, Florida. Um, I really enjoyed my, the work I was doing there. Um, what I found was that I actually enjoyed the, the OSINT side of our job a lot. Um, and I also at the time, so kind of in 2012 or so, I started having a bit more interest in terrorism issues. So this is when um, ISIS, who wasn't really called ISIS at the time, started using Twitter and other platforms um, a lot more. So they, they were always on these platforms, but they were using them a lot more. Um, so there was a lot of really interesting work, folks like J.M. Berger, um, who were doing kind of, you know, these large scale Twitter analysis and other things. And I started taking more and more of an interest in this. Um, did a conference talk on using some image recognition techniques to kind of find ISIS supporters on Twitter. And I kind of realized, you know, I think I actually want to do more of this uh, full time. So in 2015, uh, um, you know, I, I left, my, uh, left my job and uh, went out on my own. And where Hunchly came from was more that I was doing this terrorism research. There was a couple of individuals that I was watching that were interesting. Um, there was an event in the news. Um, I recognized these two individuals. I went back to their social media profiles and I realized, I'm like, I didn't take any screenshots. I didn't document any of this and their accounts were gone. Um, so at that point, I'm like, well, this is stupid. I'm clearly not like on the ball enough to remember when I need to take screenshots or, um, and I also don't have a crystal ball. I can't predict what I see today is going to be important two weeks later. 
right? Or a month later. So um, I wrote this very, it was, it didn't have a dashboard. It didn't have anything. It was just this thing that like you could turn on in Google Chrome and it would just automatically capture every page you went to. Um, I started using it in private practice when I was paired up with other investigators on, um, on open source intelligence gigs. And the funny thing was, is that when it came to do kind of collective report writing time, I was always able to produce the screenshots needed to illustrate uh, stuff that we had found. And people started asking me, like, how do you know when to take screenshots and when not to? And I'm like, oh, I don't. You know, I just built this stupid tool that dumps all these files into a folder and I can just kind of grep through them and find the stuff I'm looking for. Uh, and then they were like, the people I was working with were like, well, I want that too. So I was like, you know, like remote log me in sessioning into people's machines and like putting Python on and all this stuff. And I started asking other people in the industry that I was, that I knew, like, is this a problem you're having? And they're like, Oh my God. Yeah, it totally is. So then I wrote, uh, Hunchly one, which was, um, if any of you here had used it, it was an abomination. It was slow. It was tough to use. Um, it was all me who wrote it. Um, and, and it, it ended up that it was, it worked well enough that, that it's solidified in my mind. This is a, a problem that we need to solve. Um, so I, I put a, a, a small team together in 2017. Uh, we started working on Hunchly two and then released it in 2018. And that's kind of where it came from. It all really just came from me, you know, not being on the ball and getting that kind of sick feeling in your stomach. You know, when you delete a report or you back your vehicle into your neighbor's car or something and you're like, oh God, I feel like puking. Um, I was like, I really don't want that feeling ever again when I'm doing online research. So yeah, that's, that's basically it. And the life of the pen tester really like all the skills I learned um, the beauty of, of going from pen testing into OSINT is that um, you learned a lot of the fundamental underpinnings of how the internet works fundamentally. You, under, you have to understand a number of concepts. You have to understand how applications work. You have to understand how web applications work, database systems. You have to have a very broad scope of knowledge uh, unless you're doing very specialized work, like only kernel, you know, exploits on Windows, for example, right? Um, so that was great because moving into OSINT, there are many, many times where I can leverage that to help gain additional information or even just see things from a different perspective. Um, so yeah, hopefully that helps to, to give you a bit of history. Yeah, really. And I think uh, for all of, I could speak probably for all of us, most of us, Hunchly saved people's lives some in some cases uh, at least last week it saved my ass i i forgot about something and i couldn't find it and i was like well maybe yes and it was there it was <laughs> in the case Great. so that's i think it's uh it's good to I, and i find i'm glad i finally found out the way the path you took to to come here and well honestly one was pretty cool to me already and two is even better so I can't wait on what version 3.0 would bring us. <laughs> Probably AI a and sharks with lasers. I'm just guessing here, Joe. There's going to be a blockchain that's going to have those sharks and lasers in them. Excellent. Uh, cool. <laughs> no, we, we have a long way to go. It's a, it's, a, it's a work in progress. You know, it's not a perfect product. We know that. Um, but we, we deeply, I mean, this is uh, not a sales pitch, but I mean, we we deeply care about our customers because there are homicide files. There are people doing terrorism research. There are people who are trying to do research for their own court cases. Um, you name it. Uh, our tool is and being used in, in really important areas. And when something doesn't work, uh, our whole team feels it. Um, so we, we take it seriously. And the nice thing is, is there's an OSINT practitioner on the team who's using it. So I fully understand every time something doesn't work or every time something's aggravating to use, um, you know, that's, that's, you know, our, our motto is always like, we never guarantee a, a perfect product, but we aim to give near perfect support. And, and that's because we actually really do care about the people who are using it. Pretty cool. All right. I have a question for you, Justin. Um, when I'm asked in my conferences, what are my go-to tools? And a lot of times they'll ask me two or three tools. And I will always say Hunchly is one of them. What besides Hunchly are your go-to tools? So what would you share? Oh, that's a good one. Um, so what do I use the most? 
So I use, um, so for historical who is stuff, I use domain IQ, um, mm. comparable options, domain tools, uh, domain tools is a bit more expensive. I use them. I love domain tools. Um, passive total is another one. So risk of the community, uh, risk IQ, uh, tool again, that is a default go-to that I use. Um, open corporates is another one that I use heavily when I'm doing uh, corporate based uh, research. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else uh, for software stuff. Uh, I dabble, I would say, uh, I, I'm a dabbler in Multigo. Um, and then I, yeah, I use a smat. It really depends on the case, but I, it's tough for me to pin it down to like the top three. Cause like every case or story or thing that I'm working on tends to have different tools, uh, required, but those are some of the general ones. And I've actually, uh, really fallen in love with, uh, public dub, 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 um, which yeah. is like, uh, spy on web on steroids, um, because it, 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 it pulls more than just identifiers. So you can kind of do a bit more larger scaled, uh, searches through it. So I've started, um, I actually, uh, one of the few sites I've, I pay for, um, because it is totally useful and I found very good results from it. Cool. Awesome. So I was using nerdy data. You'd say public www would be much better than that. Uh, I don't know. I haven't done a, a, a comparison between the two. Um, but, you know, nerdy data, from what I understand, is, is supposed to be just as, just as good, or at least I hear lots of people talking about it. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, I, that's, I use public dub, 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 and you can see some of the example searches there. Uh, they're great. It's, it's and usually pretty, uh, pretty bang on. Yeah. I like that they have the examples here, because a lot of times you come to nerdy data, it's hard to understand at first. And this kind of gives you a, a walk into it. Yeah, totally. Sorry, now I'm lost in my browser with all these new tools. Yeah, man, you just totally derailed the whole podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for those of you that are, are on the podcast, uh, the, uh, again, uh, these tools, these these uh, URLs will be in the show notes, so you can check it out there on our osincurio.us website. Yeah, and I guess the only other thing I'll mention is that I do leverage the Intel Techniques site uh, a lot, too. Um, so the tools there is probably, uh, it's probably a default go-to as well. Um, there's lots of, uh, there's lots of stuff there. And if you watch Mike's, uh, Twitter feed, he'll let you know when he's updated a particular tool or whatever. And, and usually it's, it's really good stuff. Uh, I think it's everyone's go-to, uh, website, right? On a daily basis. Well, yeah, many people. Yeah, totally. Uh, yeah. And a lot of those resources I mentioned are on uh, osintframework.com as well. You can uh, find most yeah. of those, those uh, the things I mentioned there. Yeah, Justin's really good. Uh, Nordine is really good about updating that and keeping those live links and stuff going. Also, on the uh, Intel Technique side, uh, I think he's having another uh, webcast in March or April. So be on the lookout for that. I know that's on Twitter. Um, he, he has a firm like thousand or 2000 people for registration, but he's doing another live, um, kind of webcast and stuff. So that's always fun to check that stuff out. The last one was really cool about the, uh, MDA hashes and, um, you know, kind of putting emails into real people and, and reversing it and all that stuff. That was, that was very neat. Justin, mm -hmm. what's one thing that you want to learn in OSIN? Something that you don't know that you want to get better at? Financial research. Hands down, and hands down. Money laundering and that kind of stuff. Uh, not necessarily AML, but just understanding the fundamentals behind how do you look at a company's numbers and begin to generate leads for going out and examining whether that company's up to no good or whether they are um, maybe they have business ties that are that are questionable, that kind of thing. So. Um, it's always been fascinating for me. I've always found it completely fascinating to um, read books like Black Edge or to follow hedge funds like uh, um, Bill Ackman, for example, and just how these guys are able to look at a company, look at some numbers from a balance sheet or look at financial parameters and go, these guys are interesting. And then if you look at a lot of these um, research firms or hedge fund guys, they're doing stuff like, 
there's interesting co-domain ownership. They're digging into who is records. And this is, so they look at things opposite from how we do, right? Um, they start with numbers and they start looking for interesting things and filings and all this stuff. And then they work out towards the technical stuff. So I want to get better at that. Uh, so I actually signed up to a course uh, through Coursera on uh, like accounting and, and fraud detection stuff. And um, I'm going to be spending more time learning about how to do financial analysis because I find it fascinating. Very cool. Thank you, sir. Thanks for coming and sharing some time with yeah, us. Yeah, thank you so much for coming and hanging out. Hey, no problem. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. All right. So I'm going to ask everyone to tell us where people can find you online. We're going to start with you, Justin. Sure. So Twitter, I am JMS underscore DOT underscore PY. And you can just head there and find me. If you Google for Justin sites, you'll see a dude who's half naked all the time. That's not me. Uh, I'm the nerdy looking guy. So uh, you're better off just looking on Twitter. I know it's disappointing, but this is why I don't have my camera turned on. Because <laughs> I have no clothes on naturally. Right. We don't judge you. We don't exactly. Perfect. No, I Mike, where can people leaves. find you? What's that? Where can people find you online? People can find me any place where there's uh, internet. Uh, I'm on uh, uh, webreacher.com. I'm on osyncurio.us, uh, SANS. Um, but yeah, I think the uh, best place is either going to webreacher.com. That's kind of a good place for, for all of the different projects that I'm associated with. I've kind of aggregated there along with all my videos and stuff. All right. Um, Sector, where can people find you? Yep, still here. Still awake. Uh, Sector five <laughs> on Twitter and on medium.com. All right, Ginsburg. Uh, Twitter, that's the, the main place. There'll be some other things here coming up pretty soon that I will have hopefully working. We'll see. Uh, but yeah, Ginsburg 5150 on Twitter and then anything on uh, Ocean Curious. Um, yeah, that's about that. Can and Ocean Street. Team, right? That's right, OSIN.team, yeah, that's true. Uh, the Slack is still open as well, for whatever reason, uh, as a backup communication. There are people that only go into the open.osin Slack, uh, but yeah, OSIN.team, you can hit me there. Um, yeah. All also, right. that's Walter, yes. Thank you, Donnie. <laughs> Dutch, where can people find you? Uh, in the Netherlands, at this point of time. No, um, I'm... Um, Dutch Ocean guy, basically, if you type that in, you will find me somewhere on the interwebs. But you need that underscore in, right? Uh, not necessarily, because my old account got suspended. Actually, really? that's, that's where the underscore is from. Mm. Yeah. Oh. Well, that sounds Tech like a good had to leave us. Uh, Technoset had to leave us a little bit earlier, so she can find her on Twitter as Technoset, or her uh, Start Me page is technoset.com. She's got a bunch of links there. And then I'm Kerbster. You can find me on Twitter as Kerbster or Plessis.net. I think that's all we have for today. So I want to say thank you to everybody. And thanks for, to our audience. Thank you very much for joining us and for the great questions and conversation in the chat. So thank you. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, thanks everybody. everybody.